Rebecca, are you still on mute? You still on mute? Am I now? Uh, we can hear you. On the oh, wonderful. Sorry about that. You think I would have uh, been used to this by now? So, welcome, colleagues, uh, to our weekly departmental meeting. Uh, we're going to be moving to a slightly different format this week. And um, we're returning back to the academic uh, meetings. Um, and the plan is for us uh, to have um, two weeks of uh, academic meetings uh, followed by an update meeting. Uh, and uh, this week we have um, three lovely registrar presentations uh, lined up for you. Uh, and I hope you can see the menu on your screens. So we'll have um, the first presentation by Dr. Jacques Leroux, which will be on COVID-19 and um, acute sickle crisis. The second presentation will be by Dr. Elsa de Brain, um, which will be on diabetic ketoacidosis uh, as a frequent uh, feature in uh, patients with COVID-19. And then a presentation from General Medicine uh, titled Foreign Body and Jaundice. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to just showcase some of our clinical learnings um, from the COVID service, as well as our concepts um, of evolving understanding uh, of this new disease uh, and some of the manifold clinical manifestations uh, that we see. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jacques Leroux. I'm just going to uh, unshare my screen so that he can be able to share his. Okay, Jacques, please go ahead and uh, um, share your screen so we can see your presentation. Uh, thanks, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes, Jacques, I can hear you loud okay. and clear. And, you, and you, can see my, you can see my screen? Very nicely. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm just going to be presenting a case on behalf of the, the whole COVID service. Um, um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, we, we have uh, patients that move in and out through the wards and, and lots of people getting involved to do just um, the case I'm presenting today uh, is a Mr. Esso, 53-year-old um, gentleman of uh, Nigerian descent and known to, to our um, hematology department with sickle cell anemia, um, a homozygous uh, sickle cell um, patient with um, quite an uh, 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 extensive target organ damage resulting from um, multiple presentations with um, a sickle cell crisis, um, previous splenectomy, also known with uh, um, CKD with a baseline creatinine around 150, as well as uh, right elbow de de degenerative arthritis and two previous uh, hip replacements, as well as a previous cholecystectomy. He's also a known hypertensive with left ventricular hypertrophy. So he presented to C15 on the 24th of, of, of um, June, and um, this was his second presentation for the year. He had previously presented in February to General Medicine with the vaso-occlusive pain crisis. And um, on this admission, he was noted to have um, what concerns around an acute viral um, illness um, and concerns of a vaso-occlusive pain crisis with the background of a three-day history of worsening myalgia, as well as um, reported dyspnea. Um, just to note, he didn't report any cough, fever, or anosmia um, leading up into this. Um, he's known uh, with chronic, on chronic medication. He's been on hydroxyurea, um, which he self-reported to have run out. 
um, as, as he had difficulty getting in to, to get a, a re-script, as well as his chronic uh, hypertensive medicine. So on presentation, um, he was seen and uh, initial observations. He had a blood pressure which was slightly elevated at 160 over 89, heart rate of 96 and was saturating at that stage at 89% on rim air with a respiratory rate of 28. His saturation, however, improved to 98% on nasal prongs. He was noticed uh, to be clinically jaundiced as well as pale. And on respiratory examination, he had um, bilateral basal and respiratory crackles. Um, on his special investigations on admission, he had a finger prick HP at that stage of five. Um, admitted as a PUI with concerns that he had a, a possibility of a COVID pneumonia and um, there was um, concerns that he was uh, experiencing a very so occlusive uh, pain crisis at that stage. And on his initial um, blood panel on admission, um, we can note that he had a, an HP of five on admission with a normal white cell count. And just another thing of significance was that he has already uh, underlying uh, renal impairment, which looked like he had some a worsening with a, a urea that was elevated at 18 and a creatinine at 194. And um, yeah. So looking at his chest x-ray, it was noted that um, um, a picture of what looks like bilateral basal ground glass infiltrates um, with some pacification in the bases. It is an erect mobile, but one can appreciate that the heart does look a little bit big. Um, and um, the initial assumptive diagnosis was that of a COVID pneumonia. So during his admission, um, he started to experience worsening pain. And as part of his management, he, he was given intravenous fluid, as well as an increased um, oral morphine titrated up to try and, 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 and keep up with his, his pain. Um, he was also transfused to uh, red cell concentrates on his uh, initial admission. And as part of his, part of his workup, um, a COVID PCR was sent off. Um, the initial one was inconclusive, but due to the high um, index of suspicion with this case, it was repeated again on the 25th, um, which also, also subsequently came back negative. So as part of his workup, uh, he was sent for a CT chest. Um, the the rationale behind that was to, to, to um, confirm uh, evidence or to look for further evidence supportive of a COVID pneumonia, uh, bearing in mind the risk of, of, of um, an acute chest syndrome in a sickle cell patient as a differential at this stage and on the basis of one inconclusive and one negative PCR. And um, the, the findings came back, which um, I thought was quite strikingly different to what we see on the chest x-ray, but uh, they said bilateral peripheral subpleural ground glass opacities, which was predominant in the upper lobes and um, it was not typical for COVID. So on the 28th of the 6th, um, the intern was called to the ward um, at around 8.30 with the patient had deteriorated in the ward and um, it was uh, suspected at that stage uh, to be as a result of a morphine toxicity on the clinical findings um, with a depressed respiratory level uh, effort and a depressed level of consciousness. And a trial of naloxone um, subsequently uh, showed significant improvement um, on the patient. I think what was of significant was that um, after an initial improvement on his renal function from his admission, there was quite a striking deterioration. And on the 29th of the 6th, um, he had a urea of 46 and a creatinine that had gone up to 408. Um, this was the day following his deterioration. Um, on the basis of his uh, decompensation, he was also uh, ongoing confusion, which, which um, prompted him to be sent for a CT brain, which showed what uh, looked like cerebral atrophy and white matter changes, which they said might be related to the sickle cell or microangiopathic disease. And then on the 30th of the 6th, the um, patient was noted to have a urine, urinary retention and initially was catheterized um, to assist with this, which, the, which um, the patient subsequently pulled out and under uh, experienced a urethral injury um, for which uh, required a suprapubic catheter 
and passed around 800 mils of urine following that. And then on the 30th of the 6th, the COVID PCR was repeated again, um, which, which came back as positive for SARS CoV 2, um, at which stage the patient was initiated on prednisone 40 milligrams. Also, due to the ongoing confusion, the patient had an, a, a lumbar puncture, um, which showed a, a lymphocyte a predominant CSF with lymphs of eight, but a normal protein and glucose, um, which um, we think might be um, as a result of the, the COVID, um, but unfortunately we, we don't have a, a, a PCR uh, on that specimen. During the rest of his admission, um, required a further five units of red cells, also developed a hypernatremia during his stay, and had this persistent delirium, um, which there was some concerns, so underwent a CT venogram, which ruled out any venous sinus thrombosis. And as of by the 8th of, of, of this month, um, his renal function um, was on an improving trend as well as his confusion had not resolved, but was improving. Um, just to note throughout his stay, his oxygen requirements um, never really went beyond um, a 40% a face mask um, from a respiratory point of view. So it just brings me to my uh, topic today. So I'm just going to talk a bit about sickle cell disease in the context of uh, COVID-19. It's not, not an in-depth analysis of sickle cell itself. I'm just trying to link the two together. And just a reminder, um, sickle cell disease being an autosomal res recessive disease um, with an uh, um, abnormality on the short arm of chromosome 11. Um, you get various types of sickle cell um, presenting depending on the, the, the the uh, genetic um, um, presentation um, ranging from heterozygous um, sickle cell to homozygous and then various other forms. In the acute form, uh, ac acute presentation, you get acute complications um, of which um, the ones I'm going to highlight is mainly around the vaso-occlusive phenomenon um, with acute uh, vaso-occlusive pain being a recurrent presentation and then acute chest syndrome, as well as venous thromboembolism and um, arterial infarctions of, of various forms, ranging from strokes, renal infarctions, splenic infarcts, and myocardial infarctions, as well as pulmonary infarctions. Then there are other acute complications, um, the, the predisposition to recurrent infections, um, a hyperhemolysis syndromes, um, some patients um, developing multi-organ failure, um, a plastic crisis as have been described as well as uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia like syndromes. And just to get a, um, in the context of COVID pneumonia, this is obviously a very relevant um, scenario and looking at the acute chest syndrome and the, the, the possibility of overlap between the two diseases. Um, so one of the mechanisms of, of an acute chest syndrome is is um, with a decreased oxygen delivery uh, from whatever mechanism, um, whether it's an infection, and in, in this case, it could be as a result of a COVID pneumonia. The hypoxemia, as well as other stresses, um, result in a vaso-occlusive crisis um, where you get um, increased hemoglobin polymerization um, of the red cells, which is um, a lot, uh, sort of worsens the sickling and results in um, an ongoing um, occlusive crisis, which may result in further um, complications in the form of pulmonary infarcts, um, as well as bony pain, um, which is postulated to result in fat embolization. And all of this um, is a secondary knock-on effect of depressing a respiratory function, which might result in worsening atelectasis or um, worsen the hypoxia, and it starts to create a sort of vicious circle of, of ongoing um, symptoms and, and worsening acute chest syndrome. And um, obviously in the, in the era of COVID, that's something to be aware of and something to, to, to be concerned around. So just in terms of COVID-19 and sickle cell disease, there's definitely a, um, 
concerns around the overlapping disease profile, both have an increased thrombotic risk as well as a hypercoagulable state. What we've seen a lot in the COVID wards is, is uh, thrombotic events that, that, that um, have been uh, documented around the world as well. And obviously sickle cell historically known to be associated with these complications. And then hypoxia is the other, the other challenge with the COVID pneumonia, as we've seen patients with profound hypoxia, some, uh, sometimes presenting with SATs in the low 60s. And then, of course, um, the acute chest syndrome in a sickle cell um, crisis can, can result in um, a worsening um, hypoxia as well. And then, of course, there's the question of multi-organ failure. Um, COVID pneumonia um, has resulted in, in, in various um, uh, organ failures and, and this has also been documented in, in sickle cell disease and the reason why this is of relevance is because it might have an impact on, on the prognosis of the patient. Of course once you develop multi-organ failure the prognosis is, is, does worsen but in the context of, of a pandemic it might be seen as a, a better prognosis if it's as a result of your sickle cell than if it was as a result of your COVID pneumonia. As we know, once they start to develop multi-organ failure um, in any setting, the prognosis is very poor. Also, also important to note was the delirium in our patient. Um, the patient had a persistent ongoing delirium and um, what we've noted from the literature, it's uncommon in sickle cell disease um, without the absence, uh, with the absence of any thrombotic event um, for a patient to have this persistent delirium. And it's been quite prevalent in COVID-19, especially in our elderly population. And in the initial um, scenario, we thought it was probably multifactorial with regards to this patient um, as a result of the uremia, the COVID-19, the morphine overdose, as well as the hyponatremia. But despite correction of, of almost all of those, the delirium has still persisted and has, has a prolonged course at this stage. And then the only thing I just noticed was from looking through some of the literature, there has been um, associated um, um, with sickle cell disease, that there has been some association with Press syndrome. And um, in, the, in the context of Press, delirium has been a presentation, although the CT did show some changes, it wasn't overwhelmingly suggestive, and a, an MRI would have probably been more supportive, but um, obviously um, we have to take into consideration our um, infective risk and all of that, and, and whether it would alter our, our management, which in this case it probably wouldn't. So I just looked across and there was just some um, uh, case reviews that I've managed to find. Um, two um, case, small case reviews, one from the UK, um, where they had a, um, 10 patients that were admitted with um, sickle cell disease. And um, of those 10, eight of them uh, presented with a vaso-occlusive pain crisis of, of various uh, degrees. Um, and what was just of interest for me was the fact that um, six of the patients had a, a reverse transcriptase PCR that was positive and four were on the basis of clinical grounds, which is quite in keeping with what we know about the sensitivity of the, 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 the PCR in the diagnosis of COVID at around 70%. And of that grouping, um, they did not necessarily, uh, I mean, it's a very small patient uh, case series, but they only had one death, which was a patient who had very significant um, comorbidities with a very poor baseline and was actually palliated from the start. And then um, just a, a case series from um, Amsterdam where they had two patients, uh, both young patients known with sickle cell, one presented with a vaso-occlusive crisis, crisis as the main symptom and um, was uh, subsequently noted to be uh, COVID positive, and the other patient with a presentation of COVID pneumonia, but also uh, experiencing a vaso-occlusive um, pain crisis. So I think taking home from this um, patient um, and learning points, um, it was obviously um, a lot for us to learn. And um, I think one of the, the most important things was is that although the patient was uh, initially admitted to a general ward and then brought down to a high care ward, 
Um, our nurses are doing a great job, but they really are stretched and they, they're, they're overwhelmed with a large variety of sick patients, mainly with respiratory illnesses. And the challenges with barrier nursing, they have to constantly don and doff and they, all the patients require a high level of nursing care. They, they need uh, regular um, basic nursing as well as um, 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 you know, help with all the activities of daily living. And a lot of the time there's a focus on the respiratory issues. And as a result, we often overlook other areas like fluid intakes, neuroobservations, visidex checks, which which is um, just uh, as a result of the, 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 the workload that the nurses are undergoing. And then it also highlighted the, the fact, the complexity of the patients in the COVID wards. Um, this is a patient who had multiple problems and uh, multiple uh, organs that were um, dysfunctional and, and, and required quite a lot of input from, from um, various um, departments and um, also highlighting again the, the, the COVID PCR sensitivity of around 70 to 90 percent and the high frequency of false negatives this patient subsequently only on the third test had a had a, um, a, a positive PCR and I think in this context it was justified we wouldn't always do it but in this context because of the overlap of of conditions and the, the, the impact on management there was definitely more of a push to get a, a confirmed diagnosis. And then, um, of course, COVID-19 precipitating as an acute decompensation of known chronic conditions. And then also important was this characteristic prolonged delirium in, in COVID-19 patients, despite the fact that um, what we could correct was corrected, the patient still persisted with his confusion um, up until current. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jacques, for that superb uh, presentation and uh, being able to distill a very complex case uh, and leave us uh, with some important learning points. We thought we would uh, show this case um, uh, for several reasons. Um, firstly, because uh, we've been seeing uh, many chronic conditions um, present with acute decompensations uh, as a consequence of uh, co-infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, but also um, we are learning um, a little bit about um, the clinical history um, and natural cause of um, COVID-19 uh, in its association uh, with um, various conditions. I I'm going to invite uh, Graham Menkes, uh, who was the other uh, consultant on the case, uh, to just make uh, a few comments. Graham? Thanks, Tabeka, and it's great to have these case presentations back. Um, just to, I'll keep it brief, and just to say that two things. One is, is as Jacques has said, you know, what was striking was the degree of delirium that this patient, uh, uh, you know, uh, manifested in the ward. Um, you know, particularly when, when he was at his worst, when the renal function was going off, he was kind of agitated and very bewildered. Um, and uh, that was clearly multifactorial. Uh, his uremia, his hyponatremia, the opiates, the COVID, the, probably the inflammatory response to the COVID, uh, all of those things. But then it was striking that even once his uh, blood parameters started to improve, his urea was coming down, his sodium had normalized, he remained very uh, delirious and, you know, he's still confused more than a week later. And I think um, it probably speaks to the, you know, the, the experience that they've had in Europe where uh, they had quite prolonged um, deliriums in elderly patients. And I think this patient wasn't, it was a middle-aged man, but he had a vulnerable brain, uh, you know, based on his CT scan uh, with the, the uh, atrophy probably from previous vascular insults related to his um, to, to his sickle disease so that was the one point you know just the degree of his delirium and the, and the duration was unusual for what we've been seeing uh, in, in middle-aged people and probably related to his underlying uh, sickle uh, and then the other point was we, we reviewed his CT scan um, at one of the x-ray meetings and Kanita said Hartley you know pointed out that he didn't have extensive uh, changes of COVID. He had these kind of pretty small wedge-shaped uh, 
uh, linear and ground glass infiltrates in the periphery of the lung. Um, and whether that was all related to COVID or whether those, some of those were pulmonary infarcts, um, was, was a, some of them, uh, Kanita was sure, were, were pulmonary infarcts, uh, but some of them could have also, so were, were, were COVID, but some of them could have also been uh, either new or old pulmonary infarcts. Uh, and, and he didn't have extensive pulmonary COVID. That, that was one of the points. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, I've invited uh, Dr. Cecil Dutoy uh, from Hematology to just share with us uh, some insights around the association of um, sickle cell uh, with COVID. Cecil? Uh, thank you, Tobacco. Um, hope you guys can all hear me. Well, for all of us, as we said, it's a learning curve now as we're starting to learn how COVID is going to impact on various conditions, also in hematology. Fortunately, we have had some of the hematology experts in the United States and Europe share their experiences that they had during the, the pandemic in their countries. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, just getting to this patient, for a sickle cell disease, a man in his 50s is actually quite elderly. Um, you may well know that even with best care, living to the fifth decade is, is unusual for sickle cell. So, I mean, it certainly um, explains why he may have had confusion, etc. And he actually su did surprisingly well. Um, all sickle patients are considered by the CDC to be high risk to get severe COVID, of course, due to the immunosuppression the vasculopathy that gives end organ damage in various important organs like the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, etc., and also um, the high thrombosis risk. And then there's also, as um, was mentioned already in the discussion, the fact that sickle cell patients tend to get acute chest syndromes if they have severe lung infections. It was previously noted that in uh, H1N1 pandemic, um, in the United States, up to a third of sickle patients who contracted the virus had a chest syndrome and 10% ended on a ventilator. So it was clear that sickle patients were going to be at quite a bit of a risk for COVID and there was the expectation that it might be difficult to distinguish um, a patient with severe hypoxia due to an acute chest syndrome versus COVID pneumonia and that it might likely be an overlap between these these conditions. So I can mention that. And then I can just say that in a webinar about a month ago, um, we were given some figures from the uh, pandemic sort of in the eastern part of the United States, where they'd seen 210 COVID uh, cases in sickle cell disease. Um, it was over a wide range of age groups, but the um, majority were in their 20s and 30s, as one would expect. 14 of the uh, 210 patients died, and those were all older ages in the fourth and fifth decades who had um, end organ damage like renal failure or other problems due to the sickle cell disease. Just some other figures about close to 70% of sickle patients who had COVID presented with a painful crisis. So a large number needed to be hospitalized specifically for the painful crisis. Um, and about a third of those that were hospitalized had a acute respiratory illness with pulmonary infiltrates, which was then managed as COVID pneumonia, but also given the management for an acute chest syndrome, as was done in this case, was by giving the transfusions, of course, that would be management for him if there was an element of chest syndrome. I don't know how much time I have. I can mention a few more things, but I think that's the important ones to be on the lookout for the fact that you can expect chest syndrome, particularly in the older sickles, and it's going to be difficult to distinguish between the two. Management, that's only additional management really that will differ from how you are managing COVID is obviously to look at the degree of anemia and if the patient is anemic and hypoxic and the hemoglobin is below 10, you can actually transfuse them up to an HP of between 10 and 12 to decrease the percentage hemoglobin S. And if the patient tends to run a high hemoglobin, 
some of them might actually need an exchange transfusion, which I suggest that obviously hematology is consulted for advice on. Unfortunately, we don't have the uh, resources to offer exchange transfusion on our apheresis machines because they are very specifically expensive sets, so it would have to be manual exchange, but the majority will be anemic enough that one can do ordinary hypertransfusion. In this study in the United States, about 80% of the patients uh, had uh, conventional transfusions and only 20% required um, exchange transfusion. I think uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Cecil. I really appreciate uh, that input. Um, I'm happy to take uh, one final question or comment on this case. I think there was a hand up from Max Hub. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, no, Tobacco, it's uh, Mark here. Uh, okay. It wasn't a question, it was a clap. Ah, wonderful. You can see. It was a clap I emoji have... after the talk had finished. Wonderful. Thank you. So let's move on uh, to um, the next talk, uh, which is on um, diabetic ketoacidosis as a clinical manifestation of uh, COVID-19. And the presenter is Dr. Elsa De Brain, who's a research medical officer in Robert Wilkinson's uh, research group. And she's been absolutely stellar in the world. And I'm hoping she will consider a career as a physician. Um, if you don't mind uh, putting on your video while you present uh, Elsa, that would be lovely so that um, um, we are able to see your, your face. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction, introduction Prof. Um Let me just quickly get my video. There we go. All right. Um, once again, thanks for the opportunity. I'm going to just briefly touch on diabetic ketoacidosis and COVID-19, um, a very common manifestation that we see in our wards, uh, especially here in C5, where I'm working at the moment in the COVID service. Um, so our patient that we're discussing today is a 45-year-old male um, who's known with hypertension and diabetes with no evidence of target organ damage. He presented to C15. Um, in a moderate degree. The sound um, quality appears to be incredibly poor. Do you mind switching off your video and seeing if sure. it improves the bandwidth? Okay. That's much better, thanks. Uh, I didn't do much. Let me just quickly see. Um, hold up. Elsa, we seem to be able to hear you well now, so you can go ahead. A sore throat, anosmia, agusia, and also had some GI symptoms, although it's difficult to tell if that was due to the DKA or his pneumonia. Um, uh, he's his COVID diagnosis. So um, his medication, he's on metformin and relatively low doses of atrophone um, and antihypertensives. He had one past uh, episode of DKA in 2016, but no other medical history of note. On physical examination, he had normal blood pressure. Um, he had a sinus tachycardia. He sat on room was 88% and he was very tachycardic with a rate of 56. Um, on, on systemic invest, uh, um, examination, he was, he was very tachycardic, um, but otherwise not much to report. And, and at this stage, it's, it's very important to know that he's, he was neurologically fully alert, fully orientated to time, place and person. 
Um, so further investigations that were done at ECG confirmed that it was in fact sinus tachycardia. Uh, his full blood count was normal. His renal function was normal. Sodium and potassium on the formal was, was also normal. Slightly low calcium and uh, a slightly increased magnesium and phosphate, but not much, um, and normal liver function tests. He had a high CRP of 421 and a D-dimer of 0.55. Um, blood culture that was done on admission showed no growth. Uh, importantly, he didn't volunteer initially that he was HIV positive and actually had been on treatment for five years. Um, so he was presumed to be newly, newly diagnosed HIV positive. Um, which was not the, not the fact, but he, his CD4 was 326. Um, subsequently, his nasopharyngeal swab came back positive for SARS-CoV-2. So his chest X-ray, um, just for comparison, I've also included the one from 2016 um, that uh, is relatively normal. And then this one from 2020, you can clearly appreciate the mid to lower zone, um, the ground glass of pacification, um, more peripheral than central um, on, on this chest X-ray admission. Um, his clinical course, he was commenced on antibiotics, uh, which was stopped after his uh, PCR came back positive. He was put on therapeutic enoxaparin. He received IV fluids and insulin according to the DKA protocol and 40% 40, 40 face mask oxygen at that time um, seemed to do the trick. So his DKA resolved relatively quickly. Um, so within the next day, um, and he was started on subcutaneous insulin um, and then prednisone was also started. Um, his diabetic control improved over the following two days, but it was quite difficult to actually get his sugars under control. Um, the main problem two days later was that he did not maintain his saturations on a 40% face mask. He was subsequently switched to a non-rebreather mask. Um, and when his saturations were still remained below 92% and he had quite a, still a bit of a sinus tachycardia, we switched him to high flow nasal oxygen. Um, so on day nine of his symptoms, um, he actually developed a delirium on, while on high flow nasal oxygen and did not tolerate the nasal prongs, um, kept taking them off. Um, so he's, he was placed back on a non rebreather mask and encouraged to prone. Um, his saturations maintained at that time between 88 to 94%, um, especially if he was proning, his saturations were quite good. Um, so his delirium workup, uh, we did a lumbar puncture, um, which essentially didn't show us anything um, in any other infective process that could account for the delirium. His CT brain was normal. He had an EEG, which was normal. His endocrine workup was normal. His, his TSH was normal. Uh, he had a, uh, a on metabolic overview. He did at, at some stage during his um, stay with us, he did have a bit of hyponatremia, but it had resolved. Um, and none, none of his electrolyte or glucose abnormalities could really account for his clinical state. Um, so to my mind, I think hypoxia could have, could have definitely played a role in his delirium. Um, he was never really saturating very well on his, on his non-rebreather. Um, drugs could play a part, so he had um, been commenced on steroids and he was also recommenced on his um, antiretroviral therapy. So um, he does have efavirenz levels that are pending and the steroids were stopped and subsequently his ART was also stopped. Um, so yeah, he it could then finally also just be due to SARS-CoV-2 itself causing causing a delirium. So I had a quick checkup on him today, and he's currently day 15 of admission. His delirium has very much improved, um, and he's been weaned to nasal problem oxygen. So. Yeah, that, that is the summary of the case. So I just, in, in, in terms of discussion, I just wanted to highlight that neurological manifestations of COVID-19 uh, is becoming uh, more and more apparent. Um, uh, there's a brilliant review that was published in Lancet, Lancet Neurology on the 2nd of July that um, reviewed a number of cases, actually 901 patients in total were included in the review uh, with a wide variety of neurological manifestations. Obviously, we as clinicians know that um, uh, people might present with anosmia and use here only um, as, as their initial um, 
presentation with COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, but encephalopathy also seems to be quite common in um, cohorts from Wuhan um, up to 7%. And then in ICU settings in France, they reported up to 69%. Um, encephalitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome um, were also uh, reported in small series and then there's two case reports of um, SARS-CoV-2 actually being detected in CSF by PCR. Um, so importantly also not to forget about cerebrovascular disease that can occur in between two to six percent of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 and that could be due to actual uh, thrombus including um, a vasculature or, or a vasculitic process. Um, so yeah, also very, very important to keep in mind when treating patients with COVID pneumonia. Um, then just focusing in on the delirium, um, reports of delirium as a presenting feature of COVID-19 has also surfaced in the literature. Um, those who are critically ill requiring ICU care are at particular risk and maybe a manifestation of direct CNS invasion, uh, CNS inflammatory mediators or the effect of other organ system failures, sedation, prolonged me mechanical ventilation in the ICU setting and not to forget about environmental factors like being immobilized and isolated um, uh, due to infection control um, uh, precautions. So. Um, yeah, and, and also to note, as, as Jacques has alluded, that, you know, it might be a, a prolonged duration of, of delirium in, in COVID-19. Um, so moving on to the diabetes as a, as a discussion point, um, most of us know by now that diabetes is a risk factor for severe COVID-19. And um, those with type 2 diabetes, especially um, um, are more prone to complications, um, ICU admission, increased length of hospital stay and mortality. There's a bit less data on type 1 diabetics. Um, a population cohort study from the UK showed that there was increased um, in hospital mortality compared to the general population in, 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 in type 1 diabetics as well as, as to be expected. And the same study as in South Africa, um, as, as the beautiful data from um, Mary Ann Davies on the right, um, also showed that there was um, increased mortality uh, was associated with elevated HbA1c. Um, they also found that BMI uh, was an independent risk factor for, for mortality. Um, so there's also some data to suggest that COVID-19 can actually precipitate severe metab metabolic manifestations of diabetes, including uh, DKA, requiring quite high insulin doses for, for control. Um, interesting to note that SARS-CoV-2 binds the ACE2 receptor, and these, these are also very, very much expressed in pancreatic B cells. So um, uh, a some correspondence to the New England Journal has, has suggested that um, this might actually have pleiotropic alterations in, in glucose metabolism, potentially complicating the physiology of pre-existing diabetes or lead to new mechanisms of disease. Um, so this, this all needs to be investigated further. Um, so there are uh, global registries such as the COVID diab project that's actually looking to collect data to answer these questions. Um, but very important to keep in mind. Um, so is DKA more prevalent in COVID-19 and, and does SARS-CoV-2 pose an increased risk for DKA over other infectious diseases that we see in our populations? Well, unfortunately, there's insufficient data to conclusively answer this question. I could only really find one study by Lee et al. that focused specifically on DKA and that in the end quite small numbers, but, but they focused on 658 hospitalized patients with confirmed COVID-19. Um, and 6.4% of, 6, 6 of them presented with ketosis. Um, those with ketosis tended to be younger, had a longer hospital stay and a higher mortality rate. Um, in conclusion, um, neurological manifestations of COVID-19 may be underappreciated and, and we should think of that when we see these kind of patients. Um, delirium in COVID-19 can be severe and longer and can also occur in young people who have comorbid um, diseases. Um, diabetics represent a sizable proportion of our hospitalized COVID-19 patients that we see. 
Um, use of corticosteroids in treatment of COVID-19 may compl uh, complicate our, our diabetic control. Um, those with DKA inherently require more intensive nursing care and interaction with healthcare workers. So adherence to infection control guidelines is very important in this se setting. Um, and there's also an overall impression that there's quite a lot of newly diagnosed type 2 diabetics presenting with DKA and COVID. Um, and I'll end off with that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elsa, for that uh, fantastic and I think instructive uh, presentation on the association of DKA uh, with COVID-19. Um, while there is no conclusive evidence that uh, COVID-19 uh, increases uh, the incidence of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, our local experience uh, seems to suggest that um, this is a very strong association that, of course, uh, anecdotes does not evidence make. I've invited uh, Joe Day to um, give us uh, some perspective uh, on this association as well as uh, recommendations on management. Joe? Thank you very much, Interbeka. And I think uh, both yourself and Elsa have done an excellent job at uh, summing up the literature. So from that point of view, there's nothing more that I can really add other than to say that uh, we are quite uh, intricately involved in that covid dive registry. Um, and as you've said, we, we have had quite a few DK patients. Uh, Peter did a hectus uh, download and we've got about 104 patients since April that have been admitted in DKA. Uh, I just want to caution that it's very important uh, when we're diagnosing DKA to make the diagnosis properly. Um, uh, it's often uh, erroneously diagnosed as DKA when their pH is sort of relatively normal, even though they have ketones. Uh, the presence of ketones itself doesn't imply DKA. They must have a pH less than 7.3 to formally be diagnosed as DKA. And then we know from SARS um, that the spike protein was uh, quite toxic to beta cells and that there were quite a lot of uh, new cases of diabetes being diagnosed in, in, in that uh, epidemic. Um, and I agree with uh, everything that's been said that anecdotally it feels that uh, we have um, quite a lot of new patients being diagnosed with, with diabetes uh, and COVID when they, when they diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, we also have to caution against that. Um, my experience is that many of these patients, uh, their admission HbA1c um, has been quite high. Um, and just remembering that the HbA1c tells us what the glycemic control has been for the last two to three months. Um, so if uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the causative agent of the diabetes, uh, one would expect that uh, we would be seeing quite a lot of newly diagnosed patients whose admission A1C would be actually normal um, because their glycemia would be, would be new onset. Um, a often quoted statistic uh, from the International Diabetes Federation is that uh, uh, quite a lot of patients um, with diabetes are currently undiagnosed. And the current um, suggested figure for South Africa is 52%. Uh, so it's quite possible that uh, the patients that we are seeing uh, coming through with COVID-19 are part of that group of as yet undiagnosed diabetics uh, that are coming to the fore because they um, have got an infection uh, that has pushed them over the edge um, and we're diagnosing that. Um, so we do have uh, these studies on the go and hopefully in a couple of months we'll be able to answer these questions uh, that Elsa has posed as to whether um, SARS-CoV-2 can actually induce diabetes um, and whether it's intricately involved in patients uh, developing diabetic ketoacidosis. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, Peter, I know this is uh, an area of particular interest uh, for you, and I wonder if um, you'd like to make any additional comments. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I, I mean, may, maybe a few comments. I, I, you know, I don't think we have the answers. Is the simplest answer, although m many people have reported seeing what we're seeing, particularly, for example, in parts of America where they admit mainly kind of 
uh, what they call ethnic minorities, you know, black Africans to hospital, that they're seeing a lot of patients with DKA. So, so I think the papers will come. Um, and, and what we're not clear about is just, you know, we're seeing more admissions than normal, and that's why we're seeing more DKAs. Is it just a normal phenomenon, or is there something unique about about COVID? Um, and, and the background to this, I, I guess it's important to remember that in our context, we've looked at DKA admissions before in the Western Cape, and the, the majority of patients that we admit with with newly diagnosed diabetes and DKA, so, so call it ketosis onset diabetes, uh, have a high HbA1c, so it's pre-existing diabetes, but their first presentation is in DKA, and the predominant phenotype is type 2 diabetes. Uh, in the majority of those patients with that phenotype, uh, uh, in fact, their glycemic control normalizes in the next two to three months, and, and in a lot of them, you can actually stop insulin. So it, it's a reversible condition. Uh, others have named this ketosis pro diabetes with the suggestion that it recurs, although that's not something we see a lot of. So, so, so my impression is that's the predominant phenotype we're seeing here. We're seeing patients with that obese phenotype with acanthosis who presents with DKA, but they have pre-existing diabetes. And, uh, we, we need to sort of compare admission numbers over historical times to see whether there's actually an increase or whether we, you know, we are obviously admitting a lot more patients with infections than we ever have before, whether this is just a feature of that. Uh, but it's a very interesting area, actually. Uh, the, 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 the pancreatitis story, I don't think we've seen. Joel and I asked, and I, I don't know if anybody else has seen anybody with DKA in a normal HbA1c. Um, the, the, there's been sort of two cases described, and now there's a registry, and people are looking for them. I'm, I'm not sure that's, that's a very common feature at all. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, should, I should add that the, the majority of patients with type 2 diabetes who present in DKA, the ketosis onset diabetes, have no precipitant, no known precipitant. You don't find a cause, unlike those who have existing type 2, they often have an infectious precipitant. So, so, so that, that's exciting. This may be the, you know, this is a clear precipitant that we can test for and identify. So that's something new, I guess. The mechanism is probably immune-based rather than anything else. Well, thanks, um, Peter, for those comments. It's wonderful to hear our endocrinologists sounding so excited for a change. <laughs> so finally, I would, uh, Elsa, do you mind um, uh, I'm sharing your screen? And I would now like to invite uh, David Prinsloo um, to uh, give the final presentation for the day, uh, which is titled A Foreign Body and Jaundice. Um, and he's uh, presenting on behalf of the Sonora firm uh, on the G floor. Over to you, David. I think you may be. Uh, oh, here we go. There you go. Um, I think I'm muted now. Um, I'm not going to be talking about COVID at all today. Um, presenting a case that we. Um, admitted to, to G23 um, in May. So this is a 24-year-old gentleman from Hanover Park, um, and he is known to Curtis Key Hospital since 2019, where he presented in November with a, with a gunshot injury uh, that was complicated by a paraparesis, um, T11 paraparesis, and a, a neurogenic bladder for which he performs intermittent self-catheterization at home. Um, you can see here on the on the image on the right that um, he sustained um, well yeah there's a bullet or a foreign body um, with scatter in the um, in the right kidney. Um, one can see that vertebral body or the vertebra there is um, destroyed um, and the, he also sustained bilateral grade four renal injuries. But of note he had a normal creatinine two months after his injury. So um, we admitted him in May with a with a one week history of fever, confusion, and abdominal pain. Um, uh, I've noted there wasn't any diarrhea or vomiting. Uh, there wasn't any headache or focal weakness. Um, but there was a history of um, uh, inadequate uh, self catheterization. So, clinically, at that point in time, it was noticed that he was jaundiced. Um, he was tachycardic and febrile. He was hemodynamically stable and he wasn't on any inotropic support. Um, he was quite confused and uncooperative, and then he had quite marked right upper quadrant and right flank pain, um, but there wasn't any guiding or rebound uh, tenderness uh, suggestive of, of peritonism. This was his um, uh, uh, sort of a flow sheet of his um, 
blood results, um, just showing that he had a normal creatinine in, in January. Uh, and then when he presented on the 14th of May, he had a creatinine of uh, over 400, um, a severe thrombocytopenia. And then of note, on the 14th and then subsequently on the 15th, he had um, quite a marked uh, hyperbilirubinemia, which was uh, conjugated. Um, with relatively unremarkable transaminases and uh, his canalicular enzymes were also elevated but um, also um, a little bit out of keeping with the severe hyperbilirubinemia. The CRP was 194 at that point in time. The further investigations uh, uh, following his admission showed that he was HIV negative, his uh, viral hepatitis serology was negative, uh, his leptospira um, serology was negative. There wasn't any evidence of a thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, his, dip his dip sticks showed um, quite active urine with nitrites, leukocytes, bilirubin protein. And then on the abdominal ultrasound that was acquired shortly after admission, it was noted that he had a um, enlarged liver without any um, bile duct dilatation. Um, and then also I've noticed that there wasn't any evidence of hydronephrosis on the um, abdominal ultrasound. The blood culture that was done on admission flagged after eight hours and um, cultured an uh, E. coli, which then subsequently was shown to be sensitive to, um, to ampicillin. So the initial assessment was that of a, of a gentleman with, uh, with essentially with urosepsis um, due to the E. coli. Um, from inadequate self catheterization. And um, his presentation was then complicated by delirium, severe thrombocytopenia, acute kidney injury, um, as well as this uh, cholestatic jaundice picture with minimal transaminitis. Um, and then he was initially started on uh, you know, intravenous ampicillin um, and uh, intravenous fluids. So, three days into the admission, um, uh, his delirium was improving and his acute kidney injury was improving, but he had ongoing fever, um, ongoing abdominal pain and right flank pain, um, and his jaundice was actually worsening. So um, at this point in time, uh, this shows that his creatinine um, had improved, his platelet count was still quite low, um, whereas his bilirubin and his uh, total bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin had gone up with his transaminases. Um, and his canalicular enzymes improving. So um, the, at this point in time, he was then uh, recultured. Um, this is just showing a summary of all the cultures that were done during his admission. Um, the, the blood culture was repeated um, on the 17th, and this time it cultured uh, an E. coli as well as a Klebsiella pneumonia, which was an ESBL. Um, that was sensitive to atopenum, and the urine culture that was done on the 18th um, uh, showed less than uh, 10,000 cells, but the E. coli was again cultured on the 20th, it was still sensitive to ampicillin. And at this point in time, with the worsening jaundice, the ongoing abdominal pain, and the cultures that were still positive, we decided to um, get more advanced imaging and proceeded to do a CT abdomen. So if you remember the um, the initial image that I showed on the first slide, there was a, a foreign body with scatter in the right kidney. And one can see, yeah, this is um, the top left uh, slice. You can, it is at the same level as the initial uh, uh, image that I showed. Um, there is no longer a foreign body there, uh, even though it was never removed. Um, and in fact, um, one can see that it is now sitting somewhere in the pelvis. Um, and uh, um, I'd just like to you know, point out um, that the, um, this the dilated cholesterol system on the right, and um, I've encircled the, the uh, bullet fragments that you can see there on the right in the pelvis. And then, even though you can't see it nicely on these slices, the, there was uh, um, the dilated ureter and, uh, and hydronephrosis on the right. So, um, Basically, uh, then we, we changed these antibiotics to, to atopenum. We got the urologists involved um, for source control. They inserted a, a double J stent um, to bypass this bullet um, and drained the urine 
um, and subsequently his biochemistry, um, his blood counts uh, completely normalized and the jaundice resolved. And the urologist then um, uh, planned to do an elective surgical removal of the, of the bullet as a definitive procedure. Um, this flow sheet just uh, shows subsequently that his creatinine normalized completely, his platelet count normalized completely, um, and that his uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia also, um, also normalized. So we thought of talking about polystasis um, of sepsis. Um, our sepsis-related polystasis is a frequent cause of jaundice in hospitalized patients. Um, and it can either be due to an action of the um, bacterial products or the bacteria, or it can be due to um, the host response that happens to the um, bacterial products or the infection. It's quite common in children, it's less common in adults, um, and in critically ill patients uh, can pose a diagnostic challenging situation um, because there could be multiple uh, causes for this uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in these sick patients ranging from obstructive uh, jaundice, bile duct obstruction, um, uh, yeah, uh, hemolysis can uh, uh, contribute to the um, to an un unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and um, drugs can also play a role. The persistent jaundice in these patients carry an unfavorable prognosis. So um, this, um, yeah, sorry, one of my images is not showing yet. Um, but what I'm meant to show you was that for the transport of bile acids and bilirubin um, from the blood into the hepatocyte and from the hepatocyte into the canalicular system, you need integral membrane transport proteins, um, you need an intact cytoskeleton, um, intact tight junctions around the bile duct canaliculi, as well as an in intact intracellular uh, signal conduction. Uh, cascade um, and uh, why is this not working? Yeah, okay. So, um, with regards to the, the transport of bilirubin, so we know that um, unconjugated um, bilirubin is a strongly hydrophobic molecule that is transported around in the blood, um, reversibly bound to albumin, then they're released um, uh, at the level of the hepatocyte and it gets transported into the um, into the hepatocyte through the organic anion transport protein, um, gets conjugated uh, through the enzyme uh, EDP glucuronal transferase to conjugate it um, bilirubin and then gets transported into the bile uh, canaliculus through this multi drug resistance uh, related protein um, MRP2. And this is then the rate limiting step that, um, uh, yeah, in the transfer of bilirubin from the hepatocyte into the bile canaliculus. Now, when it comes to um, the liver response to inflammation, um, we know that the liver plays a central role in those response. Um, the Kupfer cells um, comprise a large percentage of the total body macrophage population, the tissue macrophages, and these are stimulated by um, endotoxin and pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are produced, including um, Tuminocrosis factor alpha and delucans, um, specifically delucan 1, delucan 6. Um, neutrophils get attracted to the liver um, and they release their proteases and reactive oxidative species that can further contribute to hepatocyte damage. Now, with regards to sepsis associated cholestasis, um, there's a down regulation of um, vasolateral uptake at the level of the hepatocyte. Um, with the membrane transport proteins, there's also a down regulation of the canalicular um, export systems um, that transfer the bile acids and bilirubin into the um, bile canaliculus. Um, and these are mainly produced by, um, by the cytokines, so the tumor necrosis factor alpha into leukin 1 and leukin 6 molecules um, uh, reduces um, the activation of some of these um, membrane transport proteins. In the toxin itself can reduce the activity of sodium potassium ATPase activity and um, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha can also reduce um, the expression of acroporin 8 which is necessary for the um, 
movement of water from the hepatocyte into the um, biocanaliculus um, down osmotic gradient. Um, and then interleukin-6 specifically causes a retraction of the MRP2 um, transporters um, that trans transfer um, bilirubin, conjugated bilirubin into the um, biocanaliculi, um, which is the rate limiting step um, of the process. So in summary, we presented a, a case of a young gentleman with severe sepsis um, and a, a, a severe conjugated microbilirubinemia, which uh, completely, completely resolved once the um, source was controlled and sepsis treated adequately. And it basically um, emphasizes the fact that sepsis can produce profound alterations in bowel acid and bilirubin transport mechanisms. Um, the, the cholestatic response itself can further um, uh, enhance the inflammatory processes in the liver and worsen the cholestasis. Um, and in a critically ill patient, hyperbilirubinemia with a relatively unremarkable elevation in the transaminases and um, the liver profile in general should then further prompt a search for sepsis after the exclusion of valerial obstruction. Um, thank you very much. I apologize, um, some of my images did not, uh, did not uh, um, project. Yeah. It happens uh, to the best of us, David. Congratulations on a really, really uh, well presented case and a very interesting case at that. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Mark Sonza um, to um, give us a perspective on the case. Mark? To be real, thank you. I mean, I think David's really summed up uh, a problem that one is asked to see from time to time and as you said a very interesting patient who turned out to basically have passed the bullet instead of a renal stone uh, causing obstruction and sepsis but i mean these kind of examples uh, of these patients one is often asked to see typically in icu where you have this classic pattern of worsening jaundice in the presence of a liver profile and enzymes that are relatively flat or unremarkable and uh, there really are always two major differentials, although there are others, but the two majors is either cholestasis of sepsis, it used to be called cholangitis lenta in days gone by, uh, or it's a, it's a drug associated effect. And in this particular patient, I think the, the, you know, the, uh, the diagnosis was quite clear, but I think you know, David showed uh, very briefly the very complex mechanism behind it and shows you very intricately how uh, the liver itself is involved in these systemic inflammatory responses and how it's influenced by a particular lot of endotoxin and pro-inflammatory cytokines that are around. Thanks very much. Uh, Wendy's sitting here as well. She, can, uh, she wants to make a comment. So just a bit of history. The first person to actually describe this was <clears throat> Professor Janet Segi. She was there at BITS. She was the first person to actually present it to describe this entity. And I think just the other thing to remember in for elderly patients, they don't necessarily have fever. So you have an elderly patient, particularly in hospital, who suddenly starts developing increasing doors, and really does need to look for sepsis, and that might require imaging, um, particularly a CT scan, often the ultrasound is not sufficient. Thanks, uh, again, Mark, for those comments. A quick question. If you see a patient uh, presenting um, with um, a cholestatic uh, uh, picture as well as um, a fever. Uh, are there any uh, other hints that may be helpful to distinguish this entity from uh, drug-induced uh, liver injury? I mean, I think the history is always important in a, in a drug-induced liver injury. So I think it's important particularly with drug histories, to go back several weeks, often up to about three months back, because there can be a lag phase. I mean, we would always be thinking about the immunologic reaction, particularly if there's a fever. And typically with fevers and drug reactions, you want the skin reaction. So it's not the usual for just a pure drug-induced liver injury to have a fever. We would usually have some other evidence of hypersensitivity. But I think the important thing in a drug is always to go back because of this lag phase between developing the injury. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, happy to uh, take any comments or questions uh, from um, the audience. 
And I'm sitting here with uh, Professor Sasedi, and she's asking why you didn't do a stool MC and S. <laughs> why did we not do? Why did we? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I must say it's a very refreshing uh, to uh, listen to a case that doesn't involve uh, COVID-19. And next week we're going to have uh, presentations from the divisions of um, gastroenterology, neurology, and cardiology. Um, and uh, I thank all of you for your attendance uh, and contribution to the meeting. We'll see you soon. Keep well. Bye.